in terms of very specific uh, behavior change techniques. So this is a schematic representation of how one might approach uh, designing a behavior change intervention. Um, BCTs there, sorry, stands for behavior change techniques. And um, what I'm going to do in the talk is basically uh, take you through this approach. Um, so the first issue is about identifying identify, uh, specific behaviors. And as I said before, really drilling down into exactly who has to do exactly what, when, where, and how. Um, and also to think that the behaviours of any individual are often contingent on other people's behaviour. So one really has to think about the whole system of interconnecting behaviours um, as the starting point uh, for any intervention. And in general, um, I would say most people when they're thinking about changing behaviour jump in with the action much too early on and don't spend enough time really thinking about the whole conceptual map of the different behaviours and how they relate to each other. Another very important uh, issue to always think about is no individual behaviour is um, on its own. It always has competing behaviours. Um, it shall I do this or shall I do that? And so when thinking about behaviour, one has to think about what are the competing um, pressures and drivers uh, um, facing uh, the individual. So just to give uh, an example of um, hand hygiene and hospital staff, um, there are several groups of behaviours, uh, so that the actual health professionals are trying to um, improve the uh, hygiene of. Um, there's infection control nurses who have the job of monitoring what's going on, giving feedback. Um, and then also there's uh, staff who are actually responsible for getting alcohol hand rub gel that uh, needs to be used in the right, um, in the right places. Um, and there are probably many more individuals, in fact, I know there are many more individuals, but just as this is giving an example, um, if I was trying to improve house hygiene, don't just stick with the target, but think about all the rest of that system. Um, and again, for each of them, it's going through in specific detail uh, these questions. Uh, just to take another example, uh, reducing waste. For each of these, one might think this is uh, one behaviour, but actually a category of behaviour. And again, one would want to address the same questions. Um, uh, some of you will probably be familiar with this program. I learned about it yesterday, but I think it's a very neat example of actually how one can drill down. So here we've got um, a program to um, uh, reduce the energy demand within houses. And you can have a think about how many different behaviours you think you could come up with uh, that could be targeted uh, to achieve this. Well, the answer is uh, 240 separate behaviours that's written uh, the report that I read, and they're broken down into these categories and these are the numbers um, for each uh, set of behaviours. And obviously one does not think, right, we're going to go and tackle 240 behaviours, and we'll go on and think about what are the kind of criteria uh, one would use for selecting where to start. So um, this particular uh, uh, program identified uh, two criteria they use. So one is uh, the impact um, of, the likely impact of the intervention. Um, and the other is the likelihood that the intervention will be implemented. Um, it's obviously one of the most effective or potentially effective intervention in the world, and it's for nothing if it's not actually um, implemented. And there are various um, other criteria that uh, one needs to think about in terms of the extent to which something is likely to be implemented. And uh, this is a very important point, that one needs to think about implementation, the final implementation, right at the beginning of when one's designing an intervention. Um, uh, too often people design an intervention and then deliver it and then realise, ah, it's not being implemented as we, uh, we thought it would be. 
Um, and by that time, it's too late. Much better to be considering implementation uh, right at the start. Um, and then uh, there are other factors that uh, one might consider uh, in terms of which behaviors to start with. Uh, so, for instance, uh, which is more likely to spill over and affect other behaviors. Um, because obviously, um, any one intervention was the maximum purchase in terms of the knock-on effects, um, both within individuals' own behaviors, uh, but also um, between people. You know, people are obviously very uh, good influences of each other. Okay, so uh, moving down um, this path, um, thinking about how does one really identify the behaviors one wants to target? How does one begin to identify, understand the behaviour in uh, context? So why are behaviours as they are? But also, really importantly, what needs to change um, to shift the behaviour in the direction you want to? Um, sometimes people think about um, barriers. Well, let's just identify the barriers to behaviour. Then we remove the barriers and the behaviour will change. But actually, um, often what's needed it's not removing barriers, it's not that barriers are pretty immovable, but actually uh, understanding the behaviour and thinking about what needs to shift and bring it in so one can have new drivers that you never identify if you just stick to identifying barriers. And uh, what I'm going to show you here is a simple uh, model of uh, behaviour uh, called comedy, and I'll explain why it's called that um, in, a, in a minute. So, the, the comedy system um, is based on the idea that behaviour occurs as an interaction uh, between three necessary conditions. Um, can you just, a thought experiment for a minute, can you just think in your head as to what you think these three necessary conditions are? Are any behaviours that happen? Let's see where you get to this. Okay, so, um, one of three is capability. You have to have the capability uh, to enact the behaviour. The second is opportunity. You need the opportunity. And the third, hopefully you've all got the third, is motivation. Um, so uh, there are two separate strands of work um, that I know of that have come up with this in completely different areas. Uh, one is a meeting of um, a grand theorist of behaviour change from the 1990s who all met together to try and integrate all their various <coughs> behaviours, uh, sorry, theories uh, together. They actually failed in doing that, but what they did do is agree on three necessary and sufficient um, conditions, and they used it for terminology, but it's essentially this. And also in US jurisprudence, if you want to prove that somebody's committed a crime, you have to prove that they have the capability uh, motivation and opportunity. So, this is a very good starting point uh, for um, carrying out a, a behavioural diagnosis. If a behaviour um, isn't occurring, you want it to occur, what needs to shift? And within these, one can think of dividing um, further, so capability, I'm oh, sorry, we'll break it off that. Um, as you can see, these are <coughs> arrows here. Um, in that you, it's good to think of this as a system, so you can intervene at any one of these points, and it potentially has knock-on effects on um, others. So just by increasing capability and opportunity, for example, it can increase um, motivation. Changing the behaviour itself has knock-on effects. That promise. Um, capability can be thought of as including both physical capability. Um, and also psychological capability, i.e. knowledge and skills. Um, that was Sorry about that. Uh, um, motivation can be thought of as two uh, processes, <coughs> very key processes. Uh, one is the reflective uh, system, which is our systematic, conscious, um, effortful decision-making about things. And the other uh, very powerful influence on our behaviour is uh, the more automatic. Um, you can think about it as the head and the heart. So uh, the automatic processes are emotions, uh, your habitual behaviours, 
and the influence is on you as a result of many years or decades of associative learning, and one's not necessarily aware of those influences on one's behaviour, but incredibly important uh, not to forget about them. And then opportunity can be thought of as both physical opportunity, uh, but also the social opportunity. Um, and this is where social influences, social norms, etc., um, come in very important. Okay, just to say a little bit more about uh, these two systems. Um, it's the reflective, the food plans, intentions, etc. As I said, the more automatic is the, um, the, the fast processing, the emotional responding. Uh, this is a different way, this is a car advert, just a different way of uh, saying the same thing. Here's um, an advertisement which is just one piece of information basically that the car is going to cost less than £10,000. And here's a different <coughs> approach that is really uh, targeting the more automatic uh, processing, completely information free, um, that you can see what um, those advertisers are trying to do. Okay, now I want to uh, go on and um, talk a bit about, more about the, the motivational system and how it works, how um, the, the kind of um, uh, interventions one might have could work through a motivational system ending up in behaviour. Um, and what's very important uh, to think about is that behaviour, I talk about behaviour in the context, but behaviour is always in the moment. It can be split second, shall I do this, shall I don't? And what one's trying to do is, um, with these competing impulses and inhibitions, strengthen them so that one goes in one direction uh, rather than another. So here's an example, um, Friday evening. Um, you will recognise some variants on this. Um, uh, shall I you know, watch TV and why are you popcorn? Um, uh, there's kind of impulses and inhibitions going on here, and there are various things one could do. Now, is one going to do one of those things? You know, what's going to, to win out in the battle here? Um, so here's a, a way of describing behaving what these impulses and inhibitions at the bottom. Now, at the top here, you have some plans. And um, one can think about, it, okay, I have a plan, and um, will that end up with behaviour? Now, the, the theory of motivation I'm going to encapsulate in a very simple way is saying that um, those plans uh, are unlikely to end up with the desired behaviour if they're not underpinned by a set of beliefs, of quite strong beliefs. Then one might think, okay, uh, one's got some strong beliefs about what's good, what's bad, um, I've got a plan, I've got some beliefs, is that likely to end up in, in behaviour? Uh, and there's one more important missing link that is needed here, which are the wants and the needs. These are the more emotional, nearer the kind of impulse, nearer the behaviour. So for any plan to really be effective, it has to work through uh, the beliefs and then through the more automatic processes. So the wanting is where you desire to do something, the need is where you're trying to avoid, you need to avoid doing something. And this is where the kind of, uh, uh, emotional kind of uh, responding comes in. So uh, um, just to give an example of um, using this kind of combi analysis of behaviour um, in relation to kind of composting, um, one might go through, use this framework to go through the different uh, aspects, so capability, um, you know, very basic question. Uh, the um, opportunities, do they have such a bit, are they accessible, affordable, etc. And then the motivation, um, do people have a plan, what their beliefs, um, and uh, looking at their kind of their actual desires, and also an important aspect of this is their um, habitual uh, behaviour. And another thing to, to, to say about this is a lot of the behaviours that we want people to adopt are not run off, you know, go for a screening test. They're um, continual behaviours that we want to carry on. 
and so um, the importance of um, developing habits which are more automatic processing, whereby it's no longer ethical, that the behaviour is very much maintained by the situation around one. So, you know, you don't any longer think to yourself, shall I or shall I brush my teeth? You're just in the bar sort of asking the guy, can you find you brushing your teeth? And in fact, sometimes I have to go and actually see if my toothbrush wet, because I can't remember if I've brushed or not. And that's a real sign that that has become completely um, habitualized and uh, automatic. Okay, so just to uh, use, the, use that example, work, work down, um, plans, beliefs, and then these wants and needs. So this is what one's trying to achieve with the motivational system. Okay, so um, what I've talked about here is about the importance of identifying the key behaviours, selecting what one's going to target, and then um, using this copy model to have an understanding of why behaviour is as it is and what needs to shift uh, in order to um, bring about behaviour change. And um, as I said before, if you don't get that right, then nothing else follows. Um, if you go to the doctor with a health complaint, if the doctor doesn't get the diagnosis right, then the treatment cycle is really effective. So, so really one needs to put quite a lot of effort and attention into this um, stage of things. Having got that far, uh, one then uh, wants to be able to link that behavioural diagnosis with the kind of intervention that's likely to be effective. And uh, there are two things which are important here. One is to have a method of linking your behavioural diagnosis with kind of broad intervention functions one uh, would draw on. And the other is to ensure that one uh, starts off by considering all the uh, potential intervention functions that are available to one before narrowing and honing in um, to design one's own um, intervention. And um, uh, a colleague, just to illustrate this, um, and you can think about the last intervention that you may have designed, or colleagues have designed, and to think about what method you used for it. Um, and a colleague of mine um, talks about a principle that many people he knows uses to design interventions, and it's called the Islamic Principle. Now, probably none of you have heard of this principle. Um, that word stands for the first letters of it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and unfortunately, that happens too often, and uh, we can definitely do uh, better than that. So, um, one of the, uh, what I'm going to present today is um, a framework. And frameworks are very useful because they can um, summarize in an accessible way. Uh, the sort of totality of what we know. Um, that's also true of good theories. Um, frameworks tend to be a, a looser um, collection of um, different constructs. But for a framework uh, to, to be useful to design behaviour change interventions, um, as I said before, I was looking for something with comprehensive coverage. I was looking for something that's coherent, that's sort of logically organised, and also um, that has a clear link to a model of behaviour. So one can start with model behaviour and know where to go. And actually, crucially, um, that it must be usable to and useful by uh, policy makers, intervention designers, etc. So um, I set out uh, thinking, do we have such a framework? And, and the reason for doing this bit of work is um, I've done consultancy work at the Department of Health and many other organisations, and they quite often come up with a framework to me and say, what do you think about this? Should we use this? And there were so many of them, and I'd look at them and they were kind of good in parts and not in others. And so I thought, well, why don't we just look at the literature, see what's out there, and see if there's one that is the best bet um, of all of them. So um, we looked at the literature and identified 19 uh, separate frameworks um, that, that we could consider. Um, we uh, evaluated them in terms of the, uh, and I would just say they also came from many different uh, different types of um, activities. 
and we evaluated them in terms of the three criteria I just mentioned. Um, and these were the results. And as you can see, none of them were able to tick uh, all three of those um, criteria. So um, we thought that the best thing to do here would be to synthesize these 19. Um, plus, we can have a, a look through what these 19 are. This is the first lot, and um, you probably recognize uh, some of them. And here's the, the next lot of them. Okay, so um, in the framework that we uh, developed, we uh, put the model, the comedy model that I've already presented, at the top of the wheel. Um, and I'll explain later why we've done it um, as a wheel. We then identified um, nine different intervention functions that all of these frameworks um, could be uh, characterized within this framework of nine functions. Um, those functions are all, uh, can all be delivered by a whole myriad of different specific techniques, but these are general functions. And then within the frameworks, we noticed there are two, two really different levels. And so we also identified several what we call policy categories. These are all decisions of authorities, um, and these policies are helped to actually enact uh, or implement the interventions. Um, so I put the reference up here, Implementation Science the Journal is open access. So if you want to uh, see this, you just Google Implementation Science, and then Google behavior change and all of this, you'll find it. Um, but what that will show you is all the frameworks, and it's also the web supplements, will show you our uh, step by step how we uh, synthesize uh, the content of those frameworks. Okay, so here's the, the copy systems I showed you before, uh, put in as a, a hub of the wheel, and then um, how we constructed it with intervention functions around it, and then policy categories around about. And um, to populate this, here are the nine intervention functions. I won't read them out, mainly because I can't, because it's too small at the back, um, but you can uh, read, read these now. Um, I'll just put out the definitions of each of these. And then, okay, so here are the definitions. Not expecting to read all this, but just to give you an idea, all well, this is in the article I mentioned. And here are the seven policy categories. And the uh, definitions of those. Okay, so I mentioned about the importance of being able to um, move from one's behavioural diagnosis to what are the intervention functions that are likely to be effective. So down the uh, left hand side here, you see the combi, uh, opportunity, motivation, and capability. And for any one behaviour in context that you've done your diagnosis on, you will have discovered that um, different aspects are differentially important. So um, one, one set of behaviours, it may be much more an issue of capability, another more issue of motivation. So every behaviour will have its own profile. And dependent on that, one can use this matrix to then think about, okay, if this um, uh, is the uh, segment that is uh, explaining or needs to change for this particular behaviour, what are the intervention functions that are likely to be the ones uh, that are effective. So it provides a way of thinking about behaviour in this context to thinking about what broad functions um, shall we think about selecting and uh, working with in designing the intervention. And then having selected uh, one or more intervention functions, then one can also think about, okay, here are the intervention functions, what are the policy categories that are um, likely to be the most useful ones in supporting um, the intervention functions? Um, if we had more time, I could take you to a, a concrete example. 
you know, it's quite abstract, but I hope you get the general um, idea of um, how one would uh, work with that. Um, so now I'm thinking about uh, the um, uh, specific uh, behavior change techniques and modes of delivery, because one can select some of these general intervention functions, but you then have to move from that into the specifics of uh, which specific behavior change techniques, which modes of delivery. So here's a, a, a diagram um, that actually Liam suggested earlier today that would be uh, a good way of explaining how one goes about this. So at the top is the comedy model, one's done one's behavior analysis. One then, uh, by using this matrix, thinks about which intervention functions one's going to focus in on. So one's narrowing down. And then having uh, selected one's intervention functions, one then considers the behavior change techniques that could be used to deliver the particular function. And there are many of them as I will show you. So uh, what do I mean by behavior change technique? These are the active ingredients uh, that um, can bring about behavior change. So the smallest component of any intervention that on its own in ideal circumstances can bring about change. And um, the reason for drilling down to this level of specificity, um, both in terms of the type of behavior you're going to start with, but also the specific techniques that you're going to work with, is that um, you, well, several things. One is, if you're going to report what you've done in a way that other people can replicate and implement, you need to drill down to really specific um, level. And also, if you're going to learn, if you can set up an evaluation of your intervention in a way that you can learn about what, what was it about the intervention that um, was most effective or contributed most to the effect, you do need to know what the ingredients are within it. Um, so the equivalent would be um, if, if in medicine people just said, well, I delivered my pharmacological intervention. You say, what was it? It was a big red round pill. You know, don't get any further. And really, in a lot of, when you read about a lot of interventions, they don't get a lot better than that. You know, very general terms that are used, and they don't drill, drill down to specifics. Um, so the, what I've shown here are examples of what I mean by behavior change techniques. These are 26 that were identified in a review of interventions activity and healthy eating. And in order to make this a reliable method for specifying interventions, each of these has to have quite a, a detailed definition. So here's a couple of examples. Um, the other thing that um, you can find in the literature is people are using terms in different ways. So somebody, two people could be using the same uh, term, but they mean completely different things, or they could be using different terms for the same thing. And it's very difficult to really make progress in terms of improving our interventions when we don't share a common language. Um, so since then, uh, our colleagues have gone on to um, develop uh, what we're calling taxonomies, basically having I mean, a structured list. So list of these techniques that are in uh, particular conceptual groupings and a, a hierarchy. Um, and we're currently um, uh, two years into a three-year project um, to develop a, a super uh, taxonomy behavior change techniques. So this was integrated all the other ones and we've got a, a, a large international um, advisory board and we've had I think, 52 experts um, from across the world work on this. Um, and this hopefully will be published in Amazon behavior medicine shortly. Um, so that this is a, 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 a method of thinking about again all the kinds of behavior change techniques that one could potentially um, <coughs> use. Again, it's, uh, if you want to read more about it, it's also in, in the same uh, journal. And just to give an example, um, uh, somebody yesterday, uh, when I was uh, talking to the Climate Works, talked about social norms and how do social norms you know, fit in here. So um, one can say, well, my, my intervention was using social norms. If one drills down a bit more using this sort of approach, 
um, one can begin to think about mechanism and content in a bit more detail. So actually, social norms can um, include any of these functions. And it's important if you are using social norms to think about which functions they're actually playing in your context, because that will help in terms of either generalizing the intervention appropriately to other situations or to optimize it. Because what we're trying to do all the time is to uh, intervene and evaluate, collect data and monitor in a way that one can learn lessons and then design more effective interventions. Um, and if one goes through the list of 93 behavior change techniques, there are um, several of them that uh, are the kind of techniques that one might use for engendering social norms uh, to change behavior. Um, so it just gives a more fine-grained way of understanding and describing um, the kinds of concepts one might be using in behaviour change. Okay, and um, then modes of delivery. Um, this is how behaviour change techniques are uh, delivered. Um, so they could be face-to-face, -face, they could be distanced in various, various ways. Um, and often when one's uh, reading intervention descriptions, there's a lot of description about what I call the mode of delivery, and very little about the active ingredients, the behavior change techniques. Um, so it's rather like um, me asking you to cook a meal by giving you a lot of description of the utensils to use, but not very much about the active ingredients, the actual food. Um, and so I think it's really important between these two um, broad sets of components in uh, age change interventions. <laughs> um, and then uh, finally, thinking about um, what one wants to think about when designing interventions and selecting behaviour change techniques. So, you know, if you remember the hourglass, we start broad, we narrow down to the intervention functions, and then, then consider all these different behaviour change techniques. And um, these are the sorts of criteria to think about. Um, evidence of effectiveness, really important. Um, we should always be um, starting where other people have left off. Uh, so um, that's, that, I would say, uh, a, a key starting point. Um, but also local relevance is absolutely essential. So much of the scientific evidence we've done um, has been possibly conducted in the United States in a very different environment than the one we're working in. So we always have to translate research evidence into our own situations. So the local relevance is, is very key. And then there's things, how practical is it? Um, affordability is becoming more, um, uh, more important. And then how acceptable is this? Um, it is? Maybe these are people, politicians, so these were a set of criteria um, to consider when I was um, designing an intervention. And I just wanted to um, finish with a concrete example of some work that I've just been uh, involved with, which uh, gave me back to increasing has hygiene, it's a problem miles over, uh, it's a simple behaviour, one would think, uh, there's specific <coughs> guidelines as to uh, what to do, and performance is very important. This is a published literature uh, on average only 40% of the occasions when doctors and nurses should be keeping their hands are they? And big variation, anything from 5% to 81%. Um, so in the UK we uh, had a national uh, campaign called the Clean Your Hands campaign and um, the uh, thinking about the combi um, analysis uh, first of all, we intervened to uh, increase the opportunity, uh, which was making sure that there was a um, hand on the side every day. Uh, we also thought about motivation, how to motivate uh, staff, and um, hospitals were involved in designing their own posters, and these posters were changed every two weeks. Um, and there's also an um, input through uh, patients. And then um, capability. Um, we set up um, a feedback intervention um, whereby, um, I'll show you the detail of this, um, uh, staff were uh, trained to begin to um, observe their own behaviour, think about their behaviour, and plan their behaviour. So, um, what this uh, intervention looked like, uh, 
we had an individual and we had a board level. So the individual level component, um, all of these, uh, these wards um, did it in 60 hospitals and 60 wards. Uh, they all in the UK have infection control nurses. And they would, uh, every week, observe 20 minutes, uh, one member of staff, unobtrusively. And um, they would then, uh, uh, if the uh, staff member hadn't got 100%, they would um, immediately go and feedback and get the staff member to reflect on why they hadn't and come up with an action plan um, for the future. And then they would be reserved for a month. And similarly, we were doing a group level to get some of the kind of uh, group goal setting and uh, collective approach to this. And so that's where they were um, setting goals at a board level and um, monitoring and they had graphs on their, on their wall. So that was what it uh, looked like. So um, it was, it was uh, simultaneously um, uh, targeting the ability, opportunity and um, motivation. And this is a way of uh, really trying to get some sort of reflective um, parts of the motivation uh, to override more habitual uh, behaviours where it doesn't happen. So um, the, the findings uh, we had, uh, we, we got um, both increases in the use of soap and alcohol and drug um, in the wards, <coughs> also a decrease in the um, hospital acquired infections and uh, also the uh, intervention changed the um, uh, percentage of times that people were uh, cleaning your hands, cleaning their hands. Okay, so uh, just to summarise, I hope we've, yeah, we have got uh, a few ten minutes for um, questions and discussion, but just to summarise, um, really couldn't emphasise enough, uh, is paying attention to uh, the, the behaviour and con uh, the, the uh, context of the behaviour, um, understanding what needs to shift, uh, considering the full range of uh, potentially effective interventions that um, uh, could be drawn on, and then delivering in terms of uh, specific value change techniques. Um, that's my research. So, thank you.